On March 1st, 2014, I married my husband. Amen. Before we said, I do, we both stood face to face, our hands holding each other's as we waited for someone to hand us our rings. Once they did, my pastor began to speak. He made me repeat after him a list of vows, a variety of commitments that I was choosing to make to my husband in light of the covenant that we were walking into. I pledged to love him for better or for worse, in sickness and in health, till death parted us. This covenant was not made because of the vows. It was made because of the relationship that existed between us already. The vows simply define the terms. It clarified how this covenant was supposed to look from the day, that day forward, and if kept, it would surely keep us. But as we all know, vows are broken all the time. And when they are, the very relationship that brought the vows to life is at stake. In Deuteronomy 5, we are listening in on Moses' second sermon to Israel. This Israel, as we know, is not the same Israel that left Egypt. All of them had passed away in the wilderness because of their unbelief, and now it is their children that are about to enter the promised land. But before they do, Moses takes the time to talk about the covenant that God made with them. Most of them were not even born yet, or they were just children when God established his covenant relationship with Israel, but his promises to the previous generation didn't die when they did. This relationship would exist for generations and beyond, but this present generation would do well to have the terms of this relationship defined. They needed to know how this covenant was supposed to look from that day forward and how, if kept, it would keep them. Let's open our Bibles or flip in our phones to Deuteronomy 5. I'll start at verse 1. And Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, Hear, O Israel, the statutes and the rules that I speak in your hearing today, and you shall learn them and be careful to do them. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Herod. Not with our fathers did the Lord make this covenant, but with us, who are all of us here alive today. The Lord spoke with you face to face at the mountain, out of the midst of the fire, while I stood between you and the Lord, and you at that time to declare to you the word of the Lord. For you were afraid because of the fire, and you did not go up into the mountain, he said. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall, not make, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Observe the next Sabbath day to keep it holy as the Lord your God commanded you. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter or your male servant or your female servant or your ox or your donkey or any of your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates, that your male servant and your female servant may rest as well as you. You shall remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt and that the Lord your God brought you out of there with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God commanded you to keep the Sabbath day. Honor your father and your mother as the Lord your God commanded you, that your days may be long and that it may go well with you in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder, and you shall not commit adultery, and you shall not steal, and you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, and you shall not cover your neighbor's wife, and you shall not desire your neighbor's house, his field, or his male servant, or his female servant, his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is your neighbor's. These words, 
The Lord spoke to all your assembly at the mountain out of the midst of the fire, the cloud and the thick darkness, with a loud voice, and he added, no more. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone, it's a stone and gave them to me. And as soon as you heard the voice out of the midst of the darkness, while the mountain was burning with fire, you came near to me, all the heads of your tribes and your elders. And you said, behold, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. This day, we have seen God speak with man, and man still live. Now, therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord our God any more, we shall die. For who is there of all flesh that has heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of the fire as we have and as still lived? Go near and hear all that the Lord our God will say. And speak to us all that the Lord our God will speak to you, and we will hear and do it. And the Lord heard your words when you spoke to me. And the Lord said to me, I have heard the words of this people, which they have spoken to you. They are right in all they have spoken. Oh, that they had such a heart as this always, to fear me and to keep all my commandments, that it might go well with them and with their descendants forever. Go and say to them, return to your tents. But you, stand here by me, and I will tell you the whole commandment and the statutes and the rules that you shall teach them, that they may do them in the land that I am giving them to possess. You shall be careful, therefore, to do as the Lord your God commanded you. You shall not turn aside to the right hand or to the left. You shall walk in all the way that the Lord your God has commanded you, that you may live and that it may go well with you and that you may live long in the land that you shall possess. I'm going to read chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, that your days may be long. Hear, therefore, O Israel, and be careful to do them, that it may go well with you and that you may multiply greatly, as the Lord, the God of your fathers, has promised you in a land flowing with milk and honey. Let's pray. God, thank you for your scriptures. I pray that we would hear them, that we would learn them, and that we would do them. In Jesus' name, amen. And what we've just read, you see God meeting the people, God giving them his law and Moses becoming their mediator. The major thrust of it all being this main idea, which is that a covenant relationship with God demands obedience. In this passage, there are four themes that stand out to me that I like to, for us to look at. They are the law of the Lord, the fear of the Lord, the mediator of the Lord, and the high standard of the Lord. Let's read verse one again. It says, and Moses summoned all Israel and said to them, hear, O Israel, the statutes and the rules that I speak in your hearing today, and you shall learn them and be careful to do them. If you notice that with all that Moses is about to say, he doesn't just want them to hear it. Neither does he just want them to learn it, but he wants Israel to hear the statutes and rules, learn the statutes and rules, and do the statutes and rules. This sermon that he is about to lay out is meant to be listened to so it can be lived. In verse 3, he says, the Lord our God made a covenant with us in Herod, not with our fathers that the Lord make this covenant, but with us who are all of us here today. Some believe this reference to our fathers is speaking of the patriarchs to which the covenants that were made with them were distinctive from the one that God made with Israel. Others take Moses saying that the Lord did not make a covenant with them as a Hebrew idiom, as if to say the covenant God made with the previous generation included the present generation, meaning even if they were not at the foot of the mountain where God spoke 40 years prior, he is just as much their God as he was their father's God. Either way you choose to look at it, one thing is clear is that God wants a relationship with the nation of Israel that will continue for generations. After the previous generation left Egypt, three months after to be exact, they camped out 
in the wilderness of Sinai. There, God called to Moses out of the mountain and told him to tell Israel how they saw what he'd done to the Egyptians and how he bore them up on eagles' wings and brought them to himself. God goes on to say that if these people that are now his people will obey his voice, and keep his covenant that they will then be his treasured possession among all people and a kingdom of priests and a holy nation to which the people responded, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. So then God tells Moses that he is going to come down on the mountain in the sight of the people. But before he does, they must spend a couple days consecrating themselves because on the third day, God was coming. Now I want you to imagine that you are them. And today is the morning of the third day. You are at the foot of the mountain waiting for God to show up. And then you begin to hear thunder. You see lightning, but there is no rain. You see a thick cloud and there is a kind of darkness that feels unearthly because after all, it is the morning time. And then you hear a trumpet, but there is no human being playing it. And with all the sights and sounds, you start to tremble because you recognize that what you are experiencing is something holy. Then the mountain begins to shake. Smoke rises up from the top of it because God has descended on it in fire. And that trumpet that is being played by no one in sight gets louder and louder and louder. And then God begins to speak. And what is the first thing he says? Verse 6. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Imagine how it must have felt to experience the terrible holiness of God in that way, to know that you know that God is altogether different from any of the so-called gods of Egypt and to assume that because he is so unlike us or anything we have ever seen or known, then surely this God will remain at a distance from us. But to then hear him say that he is not just the Lord, but he is the Lord, our God that he is set apart and yet extremely personal. Yahweh is their God. Why? What have they done to deserve him? Clearly nothing. He is their God because he made them his people. How? He did it when he brought them out of Egypt for the sole purpose of bringing them to himself. And he has done the same thing for you. When, you ask church, <laughs> when he rescued you from slavery to sin, why? Clearly, you've done nothing to deserve such a God as he, especially those of us who gathered a plethora of worthless idols and believed them to be more worthy of glory than the living God. But the living God is also a loving God who for no other reason than his glorious grace rescued you so that he could have you as his own. When God comes down on the mountain before Israel, he introduces himself and reminds them of what he has done for them before he gives them the law. If he had decided to go straight into the Ten Commandments, Israel and probably you might have been tempted to think that this law is what will make the Lord their God. Or to say it another way, that this law is what will create the relationship between God and Israel that maybe if all that it says is obey, then God will bring them to himself. Then God will bear them up on eagles' wings. Then God will save them. But we know from Exodus 19 and from verse 6, that God redeemed his people before they ever obeyed. Remember, that's a word, right? The Exodus journey happened three months before God gave his law. So know that the law was not given to a lost people, but a redeemed people. Therefore, they are to obey, not to gain salvation, but they are to obey in light of the salvation that they have already received. They 
have been brought out of the house of slavery and into a covenant relationship with Yahweh, the Lord, who is also very much their God. God gives them what we know as the Ten Commandments. If y'all mothers were anything like my granny, then you grew up seeing the Ten Commandments framed in the kitchen. Um, as if Leviticus and the law was just cute or something. Um, it's like a weird kind of fixer-upper situation. But anyway, from the mountain, God gives his law to his people in his own voice. Moses had been God's mouthpiece up until that point and will be after, but to show the law's extreme importance and to give credence as to why it should be obeyed, God speaks the commandments to them himself. The first four in verses 7 through 15, they are, do not have any other gods, do not make any graven images, do not take the Lord's name in vain, observe the Sabbath and keep it holy, are all summarized as being how God is love. And the rest, verses 16 through 21, honor father and mother, don't murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, don't covet, are all summarized as being how to love neighbor. Now, the word that comes to my mind when reading the Ten Commandments that God is giving to his covenant people is why. Why are these particular things so near to God's heart that it would cause him to list them out before Israel for them to be heard and lived? The typical approach to analyzing the Ten Commandments is to dig into the vertical and horizontal nature of the commandments as they relate to us. Us loving God, vertical. Us loving people, horizontal. But I think that in studying God's commands, we are also able to see how these commands relate to God. What He commands has everything to do with how He is glorified. And what glorifies him most is what will be in accordance with his character. So, to say it simply, the Ten Commandments are also able to just tell us something about God. And what is that? Well, the overarching characteristic of God that anchors it all is his holiness, which is the utter perfection of all that God is, the set-apart nature of his person, which can be seen in the first four commandments. But in them, we are also able to see that one, God is committed to the honoring of his name. Just listen to the four commandments again, the first four. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image. You shall not take the name of the Lord, your God, in vain. Observe the Sabbath day and keep it holy. God is the only true God, and he is to be worshiped as such. God is also the invisible God. At that mountain, they heard his voice, but they saw no image. So to put a face to what has never been seen would clearly be something God should and would despise. And his name, Yahweh, the name he has revealed to Israel, this name is special because God is. He is also holy and distinct and set apart and glorious and good and great for the name his name to be used in any way that is holy or reverent and careless is to dishonor the Lord God himself. And a God is a God, our God, that worked and rested. So if he is their God and they his people, then just as he rested, so must they. God has not commanded the people to obey anything that he doesn't care about. And the glory of God matters to God. So the glory of God must matter to the people of God. The second Set of commands reveal something similar about God, which is that God is also committed to the honoring of people. Listen to the begin. Honor your father and mother. That's people. I know some of us think they're aliens, but they're people. <laughs> you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall bear false witness. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his stuff. Each of these commands deals with how Israel is to deal with people. God could have left the commands at four with how we should love him. But God surely knew better than that. His people would need guidance on how to love him and people. Being a relational God in and of himself, since he is one God and three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, they have always been loving and honoring and enjoying each other, and they will be forever. This God, this relational God, created a person, Adam. And he put him with another person, Eve. 
and commanded them to create more people because God has never intended for us to be alive and alone. Why? Because he isn't. But in that is also the fact that each and every person since Adam and beyond is an image bearer of the Lord their God. So as God deals with his image bearers, he intends for them to deal with each other in the same way. The Lord their God created the family structure and cares deeply that the authorities set in place within a family are honored just as we've seen Jesus do with how he consistently honored the Father. The Lord their God being love himself commands Israel to be to their neighbor what God has always been to them and to us. The Lord their God will surely never murder them even though they accused him of doing so or possibly doing so. The Lord their God hasn't and will never cheat on them. The Lord their God hasn't and will never steal from them. The Lord their God hasn't and will never bear, bear false witness because God, as we all know, ain't a liar. And God hasn't and will never covet anything they have as if it all doesn't belong to him in the first place. God, God has not the command, he has not commanded the people to obey something that he doesn't care about. All image bearers matter to God, so all image bearers must matter to the people of God. And every single one of these commands are a good thing. We are in a culture that would beg to differ. To them, the only thing that is good is the, the, the autonomy to do whatever you want, whatever you please. Having any set of rules or limitations imposed on them is a terror worth fleeing from. But before I make it seem as if the culture is the only opposers of seeing the commands of God in a positive light, let us be reminded of our own hearts and how similar to Eve it can be who decided that God's command to eat from the tree was not a good thing. She decided that the better thing would be to sin. And that's what happens when we decide that God's commands aren't good. We conclude that because they aren't good, in our foolish opinion, that they can't be good for us. And if they're not good for us, then clearly God was not being good to us when he gave them. The indictment will always fall back on God. Because the commandments are not good in and of themselves. They are good because God is. And because God is good all the time, what he commands can be fully trusted. Even if the commandments don't feel good, it surely doesn't mean that they aren't. After speaking to the entire assembly, verse 22 says that God wrote his words on two tablets of stone and gave them to Moses. I love how the law was not only spoken to Israel, but written down for Israel. God had said a whole lot, and if you're anything like me, at times I might have kind of been distracted by the fact that the mountain is shaking, and so I might have missed out on a couple of God's words. But to have the Word of God written down would mean to me that they wouldn't have to depend totally on memory, but they'd have a permanent point of reference for all that God had spoken to them. But also, having the Word of God written on two stone tablets, which most commentators would say was made out of marble, would create this mental picture for what God's Word was in reality, a fixed and permanent Word, not one that should be heard from the bottom of the mountain and never thought of again, but one that should be read, learned, and lived always. Shortly after God stopped speaking, the heads of their tribes and their elders went to Moses and said, starting at verse 24, and you said, behold, the Lord our God has shown us his glory and greatness, and we have heard his voice out of the midst of the fire. This day, we have seen God speak with man, and man still live. Now, therefore, why should we die? For this great fire will consume us. If we hear the voice of the Lord our God anymore, we shall die. For who is there of all flesh that has heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of the fire as we have and has still lived? The people have experienced God in such a way that they are terrified, as is expected. Throughout Scripture, when the living God re reveals himself to a person or a group of people, the immediate response usually is fear. In Exodus 3, when God spoke to Moses in the burning bush, the text says that Moses hid his face because he was afraid to look at God. In Judges 6, when the angel of the Lord, which is, to believe, which is believed to be a pre-incarnate appearance of Christ, speaks to Gideon face to face, the Lord tells Gideon not to be afraid. Why? Because Gideon was afraid. In Isaiah 6, when 
Isaiah sees the Lord sitting on his throne, Isaiah says in response to this vision, woe is me. Unless you think that this was only an Old Testament reaction to experiencing God in Mark 4, after Jesus rebukes the winds and the waves, the text says that the disciples were filled with fear. This fear is a common response of being in the presence of God because the Lord truly is more awesome than we can imagine. That word awesome is used so out of context in our modern vocabulary that when I ascribe it to God, some of you might think that I am just saying that God is cool. But by awesome, I mean it literally. The word means to inspire both dread and wonder. It is not possible for the creator of the universe not to be more than your created mind can imagine, especially when he is more holy than you have ever been. Between verse 24 In verse 26, there are five references to death. One, this day we have seen God speak with man and man still live. Two, now, therefore, why should we die? Three, for this great fire will consume us. Four, if we hear the voice of our Lord God anymore, we shall die. Five, for who is there of all flesh that has heard the voice of the living God speaking out of the midst of the fire as we have and has still lived? Why so much talk of death? Because they had heard the voice of God. And they had seen his glory and greatness in such a way that to them, it felt the same as seeing God. And they knew that to see God meant death. No man shall see the Lord and live. Their experience with God was so tangible that death felt imminent. God is just that great and they were just so human. So they tell Moses in verse 27, that he should be the one to go near to God. (laughs) You can do that. You got it. And listen to all that God has to say so that he can then come and tell them what thus saith the Lord. They, in essence, want God to be their mediator. God, being a living God, who is not only able to speak but hear, listens in on the conversation between Israel and Moses. He hears of their fear and their commitment to obey him. God says in verse 28, I have heard the words of this people, which they have spoken to you. They are right in all that they have spoken. Oh, that they had such a heart as this always, to fear me and to keep all my commandments, that it might go well with them and with their descendants forever. I personally appreciate appreciate the fact that verse 28 is here, because it immediately combats the idea that we shouldn't fear God. There seems to be a fear of saying that God should be feared, that by doing so, we somehow undermine how loving he is and makes people more less likely to believe the gospel. But here, God says that all that they have said is right and that he wishes that they had a heart like this always. What kind of heart you say? Well, God said it. I'll read it again. One that fears him. This is a good thing to God. And while we're at it, Let me ask you this question. Do you fear God? If you don't know how to answer it, I'll ask it in another way. Do you obey God? See, the fear of God fuels obedience to God. Why else would Philippians 2.12 tell us to work out our salvation with fear and trembling and don't assume that fear can't possibly have anything to do with love? In Psalms 147, verse 11, it says that the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and those who hope in his steadfast love. The fear of the Lord comes from faith in the Lord. And this faith is in the love of the Lord as seen in the gospel of his son, Jesus Christ. So when I ask you, if you fear God, I am also asking if you obey God. And when I say, do you obey God? I am also asking, do you love God that has first loved you? If not... It is most likely because you have not seen his glory and greatness with the eyes of faith. If you have heard the gospel of Christ preached, have heard the, the, the scriptures about Christ being read, and you have only thought that God is just cool and not that God is awesome, I encourage you to look at him again. The fear of the people moves them to commission Moses as their mediator and their teacher in verse 27. 
We know this to be the case by them telling Moses that they want him to go near to the Lord and hear all that the Lord will say, and that they want him to speak to them all that the Lord speaks. And in verse 31, the Lord himself sets Moses up as a mediator between himself and Israel. God says this to Moses in verse 30, go and say to them, return to your tents, but you stand here by me and I will tell you the whole commandment and the statutes and the rules that you shall teach them, that they may do them in the land that I am giving them to possess. To mediate is to be a bridge or a connecting agent between two parties. So you have Israel over here, you have God over here, and you have Moses, not Malcolm, in the middle. I thought that was funny. Uh, <laughs> apparently you didn't. Um, Moses, <laughs> Moses goes to God, hears from God, then comes back to the people and tells them what the Lord says. The people are to listen and then obey all that they have heard. Moses' mediation is definitely pointing to another and much better mediator that would not only be near to God, but he would be God. This mediator would stand between God and those who have sinned against God because without this mediator, the space between God and man would remain. They are not holy enough to approach him and they are not God enough to cleanse themselves. They could not obey their way out of being his enemy because they were born as one and would have stayed that way if God didn't commission the mediator to do what they couldn't do on their own. This mediator will teach them all that God commands and unlike Moses, he was and is able to show them exactly what God is like because he has made the invisible God visible. He who once condescended on a mountain in fire came down to the earth in flesh. And I think we all know who this mediator is because we have all been brought near to God because of him. What's his name? Yeah. Amen. But before he would come, Moses was here to paint a dim picture of what Jesus would do when he did. As Israel's mediator... Moses was to teach them some things. Let's read chapter 6, verses 1 through 3. Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your son, and your son's son, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life, and that your days may be long. So let's backtrack for a second. Israel has been rescued from slavery and they have been brought into a covenant relationship with God. God initiated their redemption, not by any merit of their own, but on the basis of grace. Out of this relationship comes the law, which includes the 10 commandments spoken by God himself. And the rest of the law is given to Moses who then gives them to the people. This law is given to the people before they enter the land that God has promised to give them, a land that they have been waiting less than 40 years to enter. Moses sums up how the people are to respond to this law in verses 2 and 3 with two words, hear and do. It's as if he's saying, yes, you have been rescued from slavery by grace. Yes, you have been brought into covenant relationship with God. Yes, he has redeemed you. Yes, he has saved you. Yes, he loves you, but he still commands your obedience. The word of God is not something you just listen to and walk away as if God himself has not spoken. Obedience, of course, didn't initiate the relationship, but obedience is to be the byproduct of the relationship. It is in his act of redemption that proves that he is worth obedience because he is worth being trusted. God carried them on angels' wings and brought them to himself, and because of this, his word to his people is to be heard and believed and then obeyed. Back in chapter 5, verse 27, the people told Moses, that that is exactly what they planned to do. They were very zealous. They said that they would obey God. And here in chapter 6, verse 2, Moses explains what this obedience look like, looks like and how long it should last. Let me read it to you. He says in verse 1, Now this is the commandment, the statutes and rules, that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your sons and your sons' sons, by keeping all his statutes and his commandments, which I command you all the days of your life. Now, remember the people at this point want to obey the Lord their God. And then Moses comes along and deepens their understanding of what this commitment means. God wants them to obey everything always. Every minute, hour, day, week, month, 
year for the rest of their life. They must keep every single law to the Lord. But let me remind you of what Israel ended up doing instead. While Moses was on the mountain with God, before he was even able to come down to the people with the two tablets God had given them, the people got impatient. The mediator that they had commissioned was taking too long to mediate in their opinion. 40 days was too long for them to wait to hear from the Lord, so they decided to listen to their hearts and do what it commanded. So the people made a golden calf, breaking the law of God to not make any graven images. The people brought burnt offerings and peace offerings to this calf, breaking God's command to not serve or bow down to any carved images, as well as God's command not to have any other gods before him. And if things couldn't get any worse, once the calf was made, they didn't say, oh, look at this gold cow we just made with our own hands. At least that would have been the truth. But instead, they said, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you up out of the land of Egypt. When God came to meet them at Mount Sinai with all the fire and all the clouds and trumpets and lightning, the first thing he said to them was, I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. But now the people have forgotten to fear the Lord and the presence of God so quickly that they have now taken God's words and applied it to a God of their own making. Did the people keep all of God's statutes and commandments? No. Did the people keep all of God's statutes and commandments all the days of their life? No. So the question should be, why wasn't the covenant God made with his people completely done away with? Why didn't the wrath of God break out against them? Why didn't he completely destroy Israel and gather from himself another people? Because they had a mediator. They had a man who was near to God who could stand in the gap for them. A man that interceded for them. A man that was able to make atonement for the sins of the people so that God's anger would relent. A man that asked for forgiveness for his people. I'm talking about Mo Moses, but he surely sounds like Jesus, doesn't he? Because I don't know about you, but there has never been a day that I have not broken God's law. Even with his word being so easily accessible, I often listen and learn more than I listen and obey. The same standards God has for Israel are the same standards God has for his church. It is still true that without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. It is still true that to love Jesus is to obey him. It is still true that it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But it is also true that God has provided for us a mediator who is greater than Moses. Even Moses was not able to enter the promised land due to his humanity and his imperfection, but this mediator kept all of God's statutes and all of God's commands. Every minute, every hour, every day, every week, every month, for every part of his life. And now, by his death and resurrection, we are able to live in light of his life. And as we do, and perfectly at best, he is at the right hand of God doing what? Interceding for us as any good and perfect mediator would do. Today and forever, we will be called his people because we have made, he has made us his God. No, that's all bad. We his people. <laughs> the anointing left for a second. Israel was set apart by God for himself. He gave them his law after he proved his love. But as all humans have done, they broke his law every single time. We have all done the same, even with God's law not being written on tablets of stone, but on our hearts. But God, being so good all the time, has given us Jesus. And through Jesus, we have entered into a new kind of relationship, a new covenant, and within it, you have not come to what may be touched, a blazing fire and darkness and gloom and a tempest and the sound of a trumpet. 
and a voice whose words made the hearers beg that no further messages be spoken to them, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God. See that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if they did not escape when they refused him who warned them of death, much less will we escape if we reject him who warns from heaven. At that time, his voice shook the earth, but now he has promised, yes, yet, one more, yet once more I will shake not only the earth, but also the heavens. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot and will not or will ever be shaken. And thus, let us here offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. Today and for the rest of your life, listen to God, believe God, and please obey Him. Let's pray. God, thank you for speaking. Thank you for speaking to us through your word and through your son. Thank you for promising us that you would never leave us nor forsake us. Thank you that you have sent us the Holy Spirit to dwell in us so that we can do all that you have commanded of us. I pray that we will continue to trust your word. I pray that we will continue to trust what your son has done for us on the cross and that you will get us to where we got to go, which is in you. In Jesus Christ's name, amen.